welcome to The Presumption. I'm Sarah Azari, joined by my buddy Jim Griffin. Hey, Sarah. Hey. And Matt Fondelier. What's up, guys? What up? What up? (laughs) All right. So um, uh, we are continuing our conversation about Alec Murdoch, Jim's uh, client. Um, These are not secrets. They've been out there, but nobody better to hear it from than, what do they say, a horse's mouth? So Jim's our horse. Um, Jim. Uh, Some people would say a horse's ass, but go ahead. A horse's <laughs> ass? No, you're not talking out of your ass, Bo. <laughs> yeah, I'm behaving right. like a horse's ass. So yeah, a horse's ass or mouth, however you want to put it. But um, since you do speak truth, I don't want to say that you're talking out of your ass. But um, your your wonderful uh, partner in crime, in this case, Dick Harputlian, was on um, some new segments with you when you filed your trial. Uh, your trial, your motion for a new trial, sorry. And um, Dick repeated, I mean, this was a very clear messaging by Dick um, and he got a lot of heat for it. um, And I tried to defend him um, that he said, Hey, to the jurors who have not spoken to us, please get a lawyer. And so I have a couple of questions for you, uh, Jim. Um, First of all, I mean, I know what Dick meant, but what did Dick mean by this messaging? what what the message we, we we wanted to send to the jurors was you know you will be questioned by law enforcement about what happened in the jury room and and from our experience from what we know what happened during the trial that can be quite coercive and mm-hmm. when a, a law enforcement officer shows up to interview you and he's wearing a badge and mm-hmm. has handcuffs and and, and a, a gun and a gun you know it can be somewhat intimidating and Mm -hmm. and in order to get to the truth and for folks not to be bound by some coerced statement or some intimidated statement that you know they're better off having a a buffer there it wasn't some indication that the jurors did anything wrong illegal or anything of that nature i mean that they were jurors and the information that's been reported to us is activity involving a clerk of court who's a court Mm -hmm. official and they they would have no reason to know whether it it was improper as alleged in our pleadings. And so, I mean, that's all, that's all. And well, and it, it we raises an to, inter- to accuse the jurors of any wrongdoing. I mean, yeah. we're not, we're well, not no, the, but, but Jim, it raises two questions. The first question is like you said, law enforcement shows up even, even when they're friendly and they assure you that they're not there to, you know, that this is just a nice little conversation. Um, yeah. They have badges, they have handcuffs, they have guns, but, you know, the, one of the arguments being made by the public, especially the anti-Murdoch people, is that, well, then, you know, what about defense lawyers? They, well, we show up with pens and pads. We we are not armed. We are not, you know, intimidating. Um, and so there is a huge difference. And, and I think that I absolutely, I understood what Dick meant. I just wanted you to clarify it. And I think that is the mm-hmm. right way to go. And also, by the way, there is such a thing as witness counsel. <laughs> you know, people think that lawyers are only needed when you're charged or, you know, when you're prosecuting. And it, it's not always a lawyer for each side. It's always a, there's also lawyers for witnesses. These jurors could be potential witnesses if they have information that relates to your motion. So uh, essentially, yeah, go get witness counsel so that, you know, number one, you could feel comfortable presenting the information not feel coerced when law enforcement sled knocks on your door. And then also just the presentation and organization and delivery of that information, I think is going to be far more efficient when a lawyer is involved. Um, the Can other, I just jump in before you move on from it. Cause mm-hmm. it just reminds me one of the, one of the other uh, projects that I work on is I produce stories for a podcast called yes. sword and scale. And many years ago they did an episode and the, the sort of sentiment behind the episode was don't talk to cops. And yeah. especially if you are not in complete control of whatever you're going to say, sometimes cops are trying yeah. to get some information out of you. And let me tell you the public's response to this episode, it is considered like one of the most infamous episodes. People oh, yeah. absolutely lose their mind when you suggest that it's probably in your best interest to have like a legal counsel when you're talking to police officers. Well, like, also, why do people get so upset about that? No, no Matt, you know, it's, it's inter- interesting you brought this up. Um, the GMA segment that Jim and I did, you know, I go on there every so often 
my, a friend of the show. And uh, I think the first time I was on, they asked me about what, what happens when a cop knocks on your door. And I said, don't talk to them. Well, what if it's like about something that happened in the neighborhood and you might have seen? I said, no, you just don't know. You don't know. Don't talk to them. Well, what do we say? I said, well, say my lawyer will give you a call, get their information. And then the the anchor at the time was TJ Holmes. He said, well, what if you don't have a lawyer? I said, just lie. <laughs> it's like, just lie yeah. and say you have a lawyer because you get a lawyer, you know? And, and, and so anyway, in, speaking of lawyers, Jim, in, in this scenario, if this happened in my neck of the woods, a lot of us would do this for free for the jurors. Oh, jurors I, I'm don't sure have that's money. the case here. I'm sure that's the case here. Okay. And, and, and however, are there only 10 lawyers in South Carolina? Because I keep seeing the same people representing victims, representing jurors, representing. And then there's one attorney that is representing, if this is true, I don't know, but I heard that he's representing the clerk and four jurors. So my question to you is, is that a conflict? So I, I think that's misinformation. I know that's been out there, um, but I don't believe that to be the case. It, okay. in, in my view, it is a conflict. And I think it may be someone's claim that they were at one point in time, but but I think that's been resolved. And, I, okay. and you, know, you know, I'm not giving anybody advice, but, but I got to tell you, you know, some of these lawyers who've been on, you know, court TV and, and representing victims and have sued, Murdoch. Now they're soliciting jurors as as um, clients. I mean that I, I'm I don't, I'm not saying that's necessarily a conflict, but it certainly puts the juror if, if they choose to go that route, you know, their objectivity um, in question. In my view, so absolutely, I mean, that's, absolutely. So, you know, and and I I ask you these questions because I know things are a little different down there, and that's why we work so well together because. You know, we have the South meets Hollywood um, uh, dialogue. And I, I thought, gosh, if it's true that somebody's representing the accused, in this case, the clerk, and then the witnesses who are the jurors, like to me, it was it was icky. And I that's why I was checking with you. But per- perhaps, you know, something our viewers need to know. Sometimes what happens is we get approached by uh, a potential client and we start talking to them and then the someone else approaches us. And so long as we haven't really dug deep and there's no conflict, we might choose. Uh, We're going to have a conversation in a a few weeks with a a very big high profile attorney who's going to talk about a similar issue he had um, uh, in the Stephen Avery case. So anyway, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we want you to please stay tuned. We actually have a great episode coming up after the short break. Jim and I are going to take you behind the scenes of criminal defense. Um, so you're many going to be guests have... on your own podcast. Who would have thought? I said, no you're, going to be guests. you're going to be the guests on your yeah. own show. I'm taking and, over. I'm over. Right. I love it because Jim and I get a lot of questions about, you know, things that are not seen on TV in televised trials. And yet they're so important that, and Jim, you know, you probably agree that, you know, some of the stuff that we do behind the scenes is far more challenging <laughs> and ongoing than, a, a, you know, somewhat difficult cross-examination that you see in the courtroom. So please stay with us and we will be right back. Hey, everyone. Uh, Welcome back to The Presumption. Um, Matt has given us instructions to completely take the back seat today. He's going to be running the show, so I'm going to turn it over to Matt. That's right. I have pulled over your car. I've asked you both to sit in the back seat. I will be your Uber driver. I don't know what kind of music you guys like. If you want, are we to going to Zone C? We're are we driving to Zone C? C. It's going to be a long drive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we just thought it would be fun. You know, we do. We're doing something a little bit different because we get a lot of questions sent in. We always have a lot of great guests on talking about the different headlines and the big cases. But there's also been a lot of interest in what you guys do as defense attorneys and, you know, how you guys think, what, you know, what is the decision making process? What's it really like behind the scenes? And so Mm -hmm. today uh, I've got a bunch of questions to ask you guys in the hopes of getting to the bottom of it. Um, I did also want to just personally ask you guys at the top how you first got involved with criminal defense. Um, mm-hmm. It's definitely uh, a job with a reputation that precedes it, if I'm being frank. So mm-hmm. I wonder 
is it something you went to school for? Did you just find yourself connected to a certain case? How'd it go? Sarah, please start. Hmm. So interesting. I, um, uh, let me start with law school and then criminal defense. Uh, I'm an immigrant. So when you come from an immigrant family who sacrifices for you to be in the United States of America, the land of the free, you know, um, especially my generation, there's a lot of pressure to get a higher education. Um, my mom had her PhD against all odds. And so for her, it was really important for, especially because my sister didn't do it, for me to have um, a degree beyond just, you know, a bachelor's degree. And I initially out of high school wanted to go <laughs> do fashion school. And I like interviewed and registered and all that. And she's like, we did not come here for you to be a seamstress. And I was like, seamstress, you know? Um, and so anyway, uh, when I was in at UCLA undergrad studying French literature, um, and I realized I can't do shit with that degree, um, I had to think about my life, right? And what I was going to do. And, um, you know, I, it, it sort of got to law by default. Um, it's not going to be a doctor. I was not good at any of those sort of science and whatever, um, topics. And so, um, I also just always had, uh, you know, I was very inquisitive. I always wanted to know both sides. I had this sort of innate quest for justice. It just was a natural thing for me. How I got to criminal defense was it was one of my favorite criminal procedure was one of my favorite topics. I graduated at the top of my class and, and a lot of my friends were getting in trouble. <laughs> People were getting arrested for drugs and DUIs. And I had one friend who, uh, you know, went to prison for five years for vehicular manslaughter. And so I just sort of, it was like my calling. Um, and that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing, but it's a thankless job. And Jim will tell you that too. <laughs> and Jim, uh, how do you sleep at night? What, what brought you here? Yeah, right. So <laughs> yeah, my, my journey is, was really more happenstance. I, you know, I graduated from, uh, Wake Forest, got a liberal arts degree, no opportunity for employment. And so I decided to go to grad school and I did really, really well in, in law school as much to my surprise, cause I was a B student coming out of Wake Forest and all of a sudden, you know, the study of law came to me very easily. So I was at the top of my law school class. And so I took a, you know, big law firm job and, and I was practicing big law firm law and representing big, big corporations and, and with great law firm and doing a lot of stuff around the country. And I worked with a super lawyer, super lawyer, his name is Steve Morrison, who, who he was a 40 years old at the time. And he was, he was outstanding. One of the best lawyers I've ever known. Um, and, uh, but in any event, um, so that was my career track. Um, when I was interviewing for jobs, they would ask me, you know, different law firms, what kind of law do you want to practice? I go, well, I don't really know for sure, but I know I don't want to do criminal defense and I don't want to do family court law. That's and, funny. uh, <laughs> to this day I've done no family court law. Um, but I've done a lot of everything else. And, and, and then in um, my late twenties, I had my, my, my dad was tragically killed in the automobile accident. And he was a, he was a family doctor in a very small town, the rural part of South Carolina. And I remember you know, going on house calls with him. He had a medicine bag. And so, you know, and, and he was, you know, the whole town came out and grieved at his funeral and, and the, the, the line around the funeral home was around the block. And, and, and I, he made such an impact on so many people's lives, Matt, that, um, that, you know, I go back to Columbia and I sit down in this big law firm, law office, and I'm looking at a computer screen and I'm thinking, you know, if I croak tomorrow, you know, who would give a shit, you know, I, and, and very few people, you know, what kind of impact would I have in that big law career? And so frankly, I, I picked up the phone one day and I called NYU and I was going to go up there and I was going to, um, get an LLM and tax and do estate planning and move to the coast and just, you know, get to know people and help them, you know, with their estate planning. And, and as soon as I hung up, I got a call from a law school professor and said, Jim, I hear you're looking for a career change. I go, sure. I'm about to go to NYU. He goes, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. He said, my best friend from law school just became appointed federal judge. He's 38 years old. He, he came from the Senate judiciary committee and worked for Senator Thurman and, and he's looking for someone who's been out for a while um, to be his first law clerk. And, 
that's what you need to do. And so I did that and I observed, you know, people trying cases. And from there, mm-hmm. I got a job at the U.S. Attorney's Office and I didn't really like government work. And I just sort of transitioned over and opened my own shingle on Main Street. And my business model was you got to pay the bills and uh, and criminal defense practice is fees up front. And so that kept the lights. <laughs> That kept the we'll be on. talking about that. We'll be talking yeah, about that. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say that's that's a, a great transition. How that, do you pay the bills? Yeah, that kept the lights on. And then, um, you know, and I did some plaintiff's work and some civil litigation. And uh, and that's really been my model. But I really do enjoy, you know, getting to know the clients, working with yeah. the clients. And, and, and I, I do get back to, you know, the impact my father had in his community. And that's really what I try to do. It's such a good story. You know, I do, I left a couple of really important facts out and they're very similar to Jim's uh, journey. Um, and one is that my grades sucked too, uh, but I did really well in law school. And I got really lucky because when I graduated from law school, I got a big job at Baker and McKenzie. It's a huge international firm. I think it's the first American firm that was international in Brazil. I mean, it was like a dream job. And um, I went down there for a man. I left the man and I kept the job. And um, and but it was like boring as hell. It was, you know, mergers and acquisitions and due diligence. And it was just not my cup of tea. But I was having a great life. And, you know, at that young age, that's what sort of like mattered to me. And but I always knew that I wanted to be a trial lawyer. I wanted to perform. I wanted to connect. And, um, you know, I, I. I danced uh, at a younger age. So it was like my thing. And uh, when I came back to the U S I was so lucky because Jim got the call from the um, was it the law professor that. Law professor, yeah. yeah. I got very lucky because I knew I wanted to do criminal defense um, in trial work. And uh, I did not have to go put in my pay my dues in a public office. Um, I had a lot of debt to pay. I couldn't live off of that salary. But um, one of the best lawyers in the country, um, Anthony Brooklier, who was Heidi Fleiss's lawyer and a lot, a lot of other high profile uh, clients, um, took me under his wings and didn't take me under his wings where I was sitting behind a computer typing motions, which happens a lot. He let me dive in and he trusted me. I started doing misdemeanor trials and then eventually made my way to felony trials. And then once I started, Bill, I'm a, I'm a people person in case you didn't notice, um, so once I started networking and, you know, uh, getting clients, I love learning about people. I talk to, I mean, Jim knows this. I talk to everyone. I just make conversation. Um, I was bringing in business and it just didn't make sense for me to, you know, be employed by somebody else. So I went out on my own, but I consider myself very blessed because that's not the typical road. Typically, you know, you go work and get your experience at public defender's office, the DA's office, U.S. attorney's office. And so um anyway here we are here we are and now you guys have your own practices you're constantly uh keeping track of new clients and then you guys mentioned you let's part of the perks of the job is getting to know and work with these people and mm-hmm. i'm just wondering you know right from the get-go h- how do you guys even determine who your clients are going to be is there a consultation or how does that work sarah uh, so yeah so my clients um i've been doing this 18 years uh, my clients come from other lawyers or other clients or just word of mouth. Um, somebody brings up that they have an issue and then they, someone else knows me and I, you know, I get that. I don't advertise, uh, people do find me on Google every so often. I've been a super lawyer since 2000, I don't know, eight. And that then goes into the whole web thing. And, but Hardly ever. Those are people that are shopping, as Jim might also agree. Um, And they're not the people that will stick. So when somebody calls me for um, a referral, I mean, uh, consultation, these days, most people prefer to do it by Zoom. And I find that it's really efficient. It costs $40 to park in my building. Um, The person has to drive in traffic and LA traffic to get to me. And we could still make that connection um, if, if they're, I mean, I'm, I'm available in person, but if they want to meet by zoom, there is that option since the pandemic. And of course, you know, more important meetings I have in person, but I find that a lot of new clients want to do the consultation by zoom. And so, um, 
when we set up the consultation and I meet with them, I sort of do a, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, whatever, of sort of exploring the issues, um, not in a really deep way, but just in a general way so I could formulate my advice, potential defenses that they might have, and also how much they need to pay because it costs money. Like Jim was saying, you got to keep the lights on, right? So that's obviously a, a, a conversation that we would have during the consultation as well. Um, and then of course, you know, there are situations where client, the client may not be able to afford the fees. Um, I try to be fair. I try to work on a sliding scale. Um, and at that point, you know, pretty much I know whether they're going to move forward or not. There are instances where, you know, the conversation continues beyond the consultation. And sometimes I do end up representing the person and sometimes I don't. So Jim, how do you do your client consultations? Yeah. So with first business, I mean, referral is the best source. I mean, yes. by far. And attorney referral, <laughs> attorney referral is the best source. And that's, yeah. I would say that's 80 to 90% of, of, of my, uh, my business. But, you know, when the client comes in and, and I like to meet them in person, uh, don't, mm -hmm. you know, not too hard to find my office. If you know where Trader Joe's is, I'm right up the street. So, uh, and most everybody knows. dollars to park there only, too. Or? Everybody knows where Trader, Trader, Trader Joe's, Joe's in Columbia? Uh, that might be right. That might be right. <laughs> wow. And, uh, right. and, but, uh, so they can find my office, free parking, and they, they got to, Spent a lot of money on my conference room table, so I like to use it. The, and when um, you're done, you just walk next door. You got a perfect to go lunch, you know, one of those Trader Joe's wraps. I mean, you're not going to top those. No, can't do that. So, <laughs> you know what? One of the things I try to assess up front is, you know, is this a plea? Something mm -hmm. can work yes. out, or is it going to be a trial? And yeah. one thing that I, and I never do up front is say, "Did you do it? Are you guilty, or are you innocent?" But you know, some people come in and say, "You, you know, I." I'm, I did it. I'm guilty. I want to, you know, get the best deal. And, and so you go down that path. Um, but there are ways to ask, um, you know, I, I generally ask, you know, what do you think they have on you? You know, that kind of thing, not yeah, whether did you do yeah. it, you know, yeah. what, what, what's their evidence. Yeah. I, and, and one question is, did you give any statements? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you, so you kind of get a feel for what, um, what's, what the case is about is, a, you know, and how, you know, you know, is it going to be the case we can work out? Is it going to be the case we're going to try? And and I never quote a fee during the first meeting. I never quote a fee. I say so you, you know, you go, um, you know, th they'll want to know, and I'll sort of give them a range. But but I I say I, I want your permission to contact the the investigator or the right. prosecutor, and so I can sort of get my arms around just how difficult it's going to be. Right, the scope. Yeah, and and yeah. if if the is the prosecutor going, going to be got the, his or her heels dug in or, or is it going to be something that you know, can work out? And so you sort of take that into account and, and it's, you know, it's like, like bidding on a house, you know, for your contractor, I, I'm going to charge you $200,000 to build this house. Sometimes you get your clock clean and it costs, it costs, you know, 600,000 to build a house and you promise you don't only do it for 200,000. And, uh, Sometimes you take, you know, a big fee and, you know, it turns into a plea. And so you, it doesn't take as much time as you've, you've calculated on the front end. And, and, you know, in, in those cases, you know, we, we value, you know, you can't value our services by the amount of hours. I mean, we're not plumbers or electricians. And, and I mean, we, we bring a lot of intangibles to the table. And if we're able to work something out that our client, is, you know, is happy with and, you know, it, and I mean, there's a lot at a lot at stake in a criminal case, and so I never regret begrudge taking a big fee and working out a plea. I never mm -hmm. regret that at all, and I've never had clients begrudge it. But um, mm -hmm. one thing I don't do, Sarah, and you know, is is I don't force my clients to plead guilty. A lot of lawyers will, and they feel yeah. like they feel like they the lawyer has abandoned them. And oh. I have never done that. You know, those no. are the lawyers that gr get grievance files against them and stuff like that. But mm. I'm not that lawyer that pressures a client to plead guilty. I always tell them, hey, Bo, it's you going to jail, not me. And so right. I'll, be, I'll be over there fighting for him 100 yep. yeah. percent. Um, so so look on the fee, Jim, um, you know, uh, there are instances where the client has the indictment, the client has the charges. Like it's, it's pretty clear to me what I'm walking into. In those cases, I'm very comfortable quoting a flat fee um, sort of range, you know, and then 
uh, and then being more specific. But um, but there are instances, like you said, where it's really uncertain and you have to you know do your homework before you come back and quote them a fee. Um, okay. And there are those cases. There are those cases where you get big old check in your trust account, and here comes the forfeiture de- department at DOJ wanting that wanting that money. I mean, you know, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of landmines in this business. I promise. Can I ask, um, just kind of related to all of this, you guys are talking about how you guys bring, you know, intangibles to the table, and that there's kind of a a, a range of fees. Like, what what is about the paperwork when you've actually decided this is a client that you are going to agree to? You know how how does that get conveyed in writing? And you know if right. that contract down the line needs to be broken, like how how right. does all that work? So I'll talk about California and then Jim can talk about South Carolina. Um, In California, I believe that they may have moved up the threshold, but I I think it's around $1,500 or $1,000. If you are charging a fee, I mean, any fee that we charge would be more than that, uh, more than that amount, you have to have a a contract in writing. And there are certain things that you're required to uh, put in writing that constantly change and you have to keep up with the state bars rules like a couple years ago, they came up with uh, um, a, you, the fee that you're getting has to go in a trust account unless the client consents that it goes in your business account. And so when you're not billing by the hour and you're getting a flat fee, typically we've always put it in our business account. So now we have to go back and add that language in there. But essentially, the crux of the engagement letter or the fee agreement is what what fee they're paying. Are they getting paid by the, I mean, are they paying uh, by the hour in certain instances? Are they paying a flat rate? What work are we doing? What is the scope of the representation? Um, that they have a right to terminate, you know, but they also have an obligation to cooperate because if they don't, we have a right to terminate. Um, we put in, for example, our hourly rate so that if there's any fee dispute in California, no fee is actually non-refundable. So uh, if they go to fee arbitration, we have to do the math and even if we say non-refundable, do the calculation and return anything that we didn't earn. So really, you want to put in that engagement letter as much as both sides' obligations, yours and the client's, um, not in a very antagonistic way, but in a very friendly way. Um, but you don't want any misunderstandings. You want the client to know what they're getting for the money that they're paying. And just to Jim's point, you know, when I say sliding scale, I also mean that We lose some and we gain some. Um, But what I never want to do is mislead a client and and promise some uh, amazing result. In fact, ethically, we're not supposed to do that. One of the things my mentors taught me early on was uh, better to lose them now than lose them later. Uh, And so I'm very honest. You know, know, if I feel like like the guy is just like cooked, you know, I won't tell him it in those words, but I will you know, kind of tell them how I feel, like the direction that the case is going to go. But like Jim, I don't pressure anybody to plead, but I don't, I don't mislead them into thinking that they're going to walk out, you know, of a courtroom with no handcuffs. Is it different in uh, South Carolina, Jim, or? Not much. There's magic language you got to put in there. I mean, you have to tell them if it's going to be a flat fee, you know, it's non-refundable. We're going to put it in our operating account, but we also have to tell them if we don't complete the job for whatever reason, you know, they may be entitled to some refund. Um, and, and they are, so, um, I haven't had that happen very often. Um, I will say the most satisfying checks I've ever written have been to, to clients that have fired me or I've fired them. I mean, so, you know, you <laughs> just get to the point where you know, it's just too much yeah. Yeah. But, and it's usually a mutual decision, but, yeah. um, but, but, but that's right. You know, and there's there's some hot hybrid approaches that we use here that I'm not sure that used everywhere else. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll charge X dollar non refundable and I'll bill against it. And if I go over that, then then they you know they have to pay extra. That that in my experience um, helps. Uh, it teaches the client a lesson that every time they call you, there's a cost associated with it, and mm-hmm. so it sort of cuts down on needless conversations. But right. um, but again, I. Um, every client I have has my cell phone and they use it frequently. So. Yeah, mine too. I call us, Jim, doctors. Like We're like doctors. We're, you know, um, we're not really lawyers. Criminal defense lawyers are on call. <laughs> my right. phone is on. I pick up, I speak to clients if I'm on vacation, if I'm on, if it's a weekend. Um, 
typically that's when they really need you. So we're available. What else we got, Matt? Well, you guys are talking a lot about uh, really just how expensive legal work is. And I know a lot of times uh, people who find themselves in a position of committing a crime don't exactly have a lot of money to begin with. So what happens when uh, like a third party or somebody else says uh, that they want to help pay for Mm -hmm. their client or Mm -hmm. for your client rather? Is that even something legal? So it's legal in California. I'll tell you what that is. It's uh, it's a, we have to get a conflict waiver signed by the client. And I'll give you a scenario. For example, you have a client who is accused of any crime, but has a drug problem and needs to go to treatment. Um, and, you know, the, he doesn't want to go to treatment. And the mother who's paying his fees, and he's an adult client, um, wants him to be in jail for three months and learn his lesson and do tough love and then go into treatment. And so we have to make it very clear to the client in writing and get their sign signature that they understand that even though we're getting payment from a third party, that our duties that are to them and that they are our client, not the third party payer. So um, that is a very important document that we have to get signed. It's a conflict waiver. Um, And, and, you know, that it comes up where people who uh, pay for a family member or a friend, they want to know about the case. They want to know about the evidence. They want a copy of the police report. They want to have, get a a specific result. You know, there are a lot of families who would rather have their loved one in jail. You know, I don't know what you have. I don't know if you've ever had that request, but I get that request a lot. Let him stay there. Just can you, can you make sure he's there for at least a year? It's like, no, you're not my client, Bo. Anyway, that's sort of how uh, that raises issues when somebody else is paying. There's ex- expectations that we cannot manage. It's it's they're not our client. Same here, same here, and and you have to make it clear. You know, the person paying doesn't control the case. Yes. But an, an, another thing that's very important, and and we have a lot of, we I'm in the college town, so frequently parents are hiring lawyers for their son or daughter who get in trouble. And we have to tell the parents, look, you can't sit in the room when I'm talking to your son or daughter because the attorney client privilege only applies to him or her and me. If you're in the room, it voids it. And they, they want to sit down for the interview. They, they want to be there and hold hands. You know, they want to be the helicopter parent and, you know, you're just going to say no. And then when the, the daughter says, you know, don't tell my dad I was snorting cocaine and i was in a group sex party i mean you can't tell dad that your daughter is out there you know acting up i mean you can't do that so so that you know those are kind of um is that a real story somebody told you that they're going to groups okay you never know with us you never know with us we have good stories (laughs) yeah yeah uh well well again sort of on this topic, one of uh, the more interesting types of true crime cases that I've researched in my time are cases that have co-defendants. And, you know, they're always kind of pointing the finger at each other and you get little glimpses of the truth, but then the other defendant has something different to say. So again, just talking about conflicts of interest, you know, how do you handle a co-defendant case? And, you know, like, are you do you have a relationship with the other defendant's lawyer as well? Because you guys are, do you guys kind of work together or maybe I'm confusing in this a little bit, but. Yeah. I mean, we, we, there are cases where our interests are aligned to some extent. And then it's sort of, there's a fork in the road. There are cases where we're absolutely pointing the finger, like for our viewers, I'm using my two index fingers in the opposite direction. Um, and so it just depends. And, and, and in, in federal cases, it's very common that we would do a joint defense agreement with a co-defendant, uh, where we share information and we sort of form an alliance in, uh, in response to the prosecution's, um, evidence and, uh, you know, allegations. Uh, another question for you guys, just kind of on the topic of, you know, client management, a lot of people think that your job is just what they see you doing in court. But, you know, there's, as you were saying earlier, you guys are constantly on call with your cell phones. You know, how much time are you guys spending with the clients outside of the proceedings just to connect? How important is that? Um, 
it's important to connect with your client. I keep it professional. I've had um, situations where, you know, clients get really comfortable. Uh, by the way, I have clients who maintain friendships with me. I get Christmas gifts. I go to Christmas parties. Uh, but typically, you know, clients sometimes don't realize the boundaries, the professional boundaries, and they want to, uh, you know, they want to hang out and they want to do dinner that, you know, in, I, I, I try, it depends on the client. I, um, I try to keep it very professional. Um, I once had a, a client's father, um, uh, just like, and this was the, not the client's, the client's father was trying to date me. And I was like, not interested in the guy. And I said, I think the state bar rules, uh, actually prohibit dating. And he goes, well, I'm not your client. I'm the father. And I said, no, I think it extends to the family members. But anyway, it, it, I, I try to keep it, but you know, listen, we have, there are also clients that are, um, you know, I have clients that are in the federal system that are professionals themselves. And like, we have to do a lunch meeting or we have to do a dinner. I mean, that's different, but it's very, very important to get to know our clients. I'll let Jim speak about this. Yeah. It, 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 I view our position like a just a uh, internist or family practitioner doctor, and they come in. They have all these problems. You know, they may be addicted to drugs. They have all you know other issues, and so they come to us, and 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 we we refer them out to the appropriate professional for the help they need to get their feet on the ground. So that then we when they come back in front of a judge, you know, they're a different person. And we yeah. can talk about the success that this person has turned his, his or her life around mm -hmm. and, and, and they get rewarded for, you know, their own um, journey for doing the right things makes our job easier. And so, you know, and I monitor that, I monitor that. And, you know, I, I have, um, you know, I've, I've been in the car with a parent who's, you know, trying to take up for uh, in their son, wanting to go here, there, or yonder. And I say, well, you know, mom, if, if you want your son to have boyfriends instead of girlfriends and boyfriends in prison, then y'all just keep going down this road. But I suggest that, you know, you tighten it up and, um, you know, that's the kind of, you know, tough love that, you know, yes, you, we got to give them. Do you guys ever had that, like come to Jesus moment though, where you're like yeah. enough of this person. Oh yeah. Well, look, yeah. Look, look, we are human beings and I'm, we can't like, I mean, the honest truth is that, Sometimes you click at, at, with one person more than you do with another person. We still have a job to do. I still do my job. Um, but there are circumstances, there are clients that I've come across, you know, over the years that just tug at my heart, you know, in a way that it's either them, the circumstance, the reason why they ended up in the circumstance. And so um, it's not like, uh, I'm going to give them a better defense than the other person, but it, it, we're human beings. I mean, it just, it really sort of ignites that, that fire of, of why I'm doing the job. Right. Um, and, and to Jim's point, you know, we become counselors, we become family unifiers, we become, um, consiglieres, confidants and, uh, and, and so our job is so much more than just going to court on a motion hearing or for trial or a change of plea. We, you know, we are counselors, you know, we are guiding the person because with the criminal charge comes an absolute devastation of a whole gamut of things, you know. And so we're trying to help this person while we're trying to dismantle uh, the prosecution's case. We're trying to help this person rebuild their life. And so it's multiple hats, a lot of hats. Um, uh, and I, by the way, I never ask a client either, Jim, whether he did it. I could care less if he did it. But very soon that answer uh, just reveals itself. I think when you have that conversation, Matt was saying, come to Jesus. Um, I sort of lay out the investigation. I lay out the prosecution's evidence and we have a long conversation and I sort of show them how it would play out. What are the defenses? What can we argue for this bad fact and that bad fact? And it's almost like they <laughs> get to that point and they're like, yeah, you know, like, it, so the plea is their decision. Go, going to trial is their decision, but our, it's our job to, you know, fully advise them and, um, and have enough contact with them where there's a trust and there's communication. 
Uh, wanted to ask about just some kind of general legal terms, again, just kind of related to all this. Uh, mitigation, Sarah, I've heard you use that word a lot where, you know, you're trying to mitigate your client's culpability and it's not really a defense, but it kind of brings the temperature down. Mm-hmm. Can you explain what that means? And, you know, is mitigation synonymous with guilt? How does that break down? No. So so Jim kind of hit on that. So I my style is to start mitigation parallel to litigation, because you just never know. A criminal case is a fluid process. You just never know what direction it might take. And so um, I immediately try to get my client the help they need, whether it's to go into treatment, whether it's to get counseling, anger management, um, uh, you know, letters, character references, whatever that might look like. It's so important because if the client has to plea, it helps us get a better deal for the client. It shows um, rehabilitation. It shows that they've taken remedial steps. Um, it sometimes is the antithesis of the, the, the criminal profile that the prosecution's evidence has, has built around this person. Um, it helps us at sentencing with the judge. So it's incredibly important that I, I think that even if it ends up not being important, it's worth taking those steps just in case we need it. Um, the, the pushback I get, uh, Jim on this is like, you know, when you tell a client, uh, let's say you've got a domestic violence case, a felony domestic violence, and typically there's a lot of drinking involved in those. And you tell the client, I really need you to go to AA meetings three times a week and have the secretary sign the AA card. And they're like, uh, I'm not an alcoholic. And you're like, I know but this will look good for you. And they're like, well, if I do this, then they're going to say I'm guilty because I'm a drunk and I did beat up my wife. And it's like, you have to have this conversation of, no, this is going to bring the temperature down. It's in your benefit. Um, you're going to bet. And by the way, my, my um, speech to those clients is like, everyone can benefit from 12 steps, literally, whether you have a problem or not. It's, it's a great sort of manual on how to live your life. And so that's sort of the pushback that I get. What about you, Jim? Yeah, you know, a lot of um, a lot of my stuff is white collar, and yeah. I don't, um, you know, I, I I don't spend a whole lot of time in mitigation. Um, you know, our mitigation is trying to find out, you know, what kind of money we can come up to pay restitution, and that's and, right, and. But- but we that's do. also mitigation. No, it, it, it that's, that's what yeah. I said. My mitigation yeah. is restitution for the most yeah. part. Um, yeah. And, and it's very, very important to, to, to be able to do that. They absolutely. And, and, and oftentimes in this, you know, world we live in, you've got the federal government wanting to forfeit the money that could be used to pay to restitution to the victims. And, and so you got to navigate through that, but, but my, my experience has been for, you know, white collar cases, if you can pay the money back, the sooner the better. And it, it puts you in a much better position. Well, it also goes to the loss amount and it'll, it gives you more wiggle room in your dealings with the prosecution. But, you know, probably 65 percent of my cases are also white collar. And in that realm, you brought a good, good, good point up. Aside from restitution, I've had instances where, you know, I had a, a high profile client involved with SAG pension plans. And, you know, he really did have severe um, mental issues, PTSD, depression, et cetera. And those obviously play a role in terms of 3553 factors at sentencing. And so even though the charge was tax and uh, kickback scheme, et cetera, um, the mental illness component is almost present in every case. And I think that that's one of the reasons you and I decided to do this podcast. Um, So, all right. So what else do we got, Matt? Well, another legal term I've heard a lot is discovery. And to me, that seems like probably the most fun part of uh, being a lawyer when you kind of get that dump of information. But uh, I can see you shaking your head, Jim. Uh, Maybe it's not so much fun. How how do you guys go about the discovery? How does that work? Yeah. you, You know, the, Cases nowadays, the discovery is is all e discovery. I mean, they they produced uh, uh, I can't even the, the volume of, of stuff we get is uh, extraordinary in some of these big cases, and and you, you and so there are 
software uh, products that we use to to um, to filter dedupe we call it so so you'll, you'll get an email dump and you'll you'll have one e- email thread produced three thousand times i mean just because mm-hmm. it's looked over and over and over again and so there's software programs that will go through distill that down and you only have to look at it one time and so you know relativity is one logical is another i mean we use relativity here um, and so there's electronic discovery mechanisms that, that distill it down. And then you have paralegals that go through and code the documents and, and you review everything and you flag them. And, and, you, and then all the documents can be searched by keyword searches. Um, and, yeah. and so, you know, and in, in doing so, I mean, frankly, in that Murdoch case, we were able to unearth stuff that, that's, that the attorney general produced to us. They didn't even know they produced and, mm. and it was very helpful to the, to us. And so, but you've got to do it. It costs money. It takes time, but you've got, to, you've got to do it. Um, in other cases you fight tooth and nail to get one piece of paper. I mean, and so it, it's not, it's not every case, but the federal cases that we have, the white collar cases we have, you know, what, what we're seeing now is, you know, we get a lot of, uh, you know, it's, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, frankly. And so to get to that needle, you, you've got to spend money and, you know, it's, it's not cheap. And then, well, but wait a second. So, so typically, uh, the in the federal system, my white collar cases, the government, at least here in my district, sends us a link to a box, and the discovery's in there. And every time there's new discovery, it goes in there. Um, I always do a discovery letter because I go through, and like Jim said, it's a dump, and I use multiple paralegals. Sometimes I have to use an outside service, litigation service. Um, to kind of sort through. And then I have my own, my brain works in a weird way. So I keep a set of the discovery and the way it's delivered to me in the event, you know, we end up in trial, but I also keep like, if it's bait stamped, I do a whole other thing where it'll be out of order because it's just the way that I like to review something. So um, it really depends on the case, state case, federal case, white collar, street crime. It just depends. But for on the state side, we have um, what's called Rule 1054, which governs our discovery. Um, we do get, when I talk to lawyers from around the country, Jim, I realize I'm so blessed to practice in Los Angeles, in California, because we really do get a lot of stuff um, that in other places is not disclosed un- unless and until you go to trial. Um, we get some discovery. Then I do a discovery request asking for more discovery. This is probably the best example is the Coburger case, similar to that. And um, very rarely do I have to do a motion to compel, but sometimes I've had to do it. And there are things, however, that fall outside of the rule that I have to subpoena. And that's sort of defense investigation. So things that the prosecution really does not have or they're not exculpatory, they have no obligation to get. um, That is my duty to then use the subpoena power of the court, issue subpoenas, for example, for phone records, psychological records, employment, school records, any sort of outside um, social media, for example, uh, is done by subpoena. And then here it goes to the court file and we, I go in and pick it up um, from the clerk, but man, the prosecutors always think, and I, I literally have to go with the case law at hand, right? They always think that they get to have a copy of it. And I'm like, yo, sixth amendment, (laughs) <laughs> do your own investigation. <laughs> like, I don't need to do your, this is mine. I use the subpoena power of the court to be able to defend my client. And they literally think that they're entitled to everything that I get. And it's nothing irks me more, which is why I'm fired up right now. But, um, you know, we, we get discovery, we request discovery, we issue subpoenas. That's pretty much what we do. Well, you have no idea how lucky you are because we don't have the ability here in South Carolina to issue subpoenas in state court in criminal cases, unless it's subpoenaed documents and witnesses to a hearing. We, oh, we, wow. we, we can't just serve subpoenas for documents and have them produce them to the, to the court and then give them to us. I mean, well, we put the date Jim of the next hearing, right. But that doesn't mean it's trial. It could be the pretrial hearing. Right. Yeah. And we, and then they, they have to comply by that date. And we say, Hey, um, your honor, we have some records we were expecting. He goes, Hey clerk, do you have them? Yes, we do. And then we get them. Right. Um, right. So we, you know, we, we, we get forthwith orders in federal court. Um, 
you know, some state court judges will give them, some won't, but it's, you really have to, um, you, you have to use your, uh, you know, all your skills to get information, um, as a criminal defense lawyer and you have to use your own investigators and you have to, and they have, have access to electronic information. And sometimes you get stuff, Matt, that you don't want to know how you got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm just telling <laughs> exactly. you, but, yeah, the yeah. best investigators will say, "Hey, look what I found. Where'd you find it?" Well, you don't want to know where I found it. And I said, okay. right. The magician never reveals the secrets. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. broke into well, the DMV. It's like during the time. during the pandemic, I uh, found this paralegal who was not working for me. It was working for, for a different lawyer, and I was doing a lot of these first step act motions to get people out because of COVID, a federal prison, and uh, and this woman was getting these internal things from the county public health office by this prison that governed this prison and they were so damning they just basically showed that the prison was doing nothing to protect the inmates from covid um and so i was using these as exhibits to my motions and literally every prison official at this one prison at water was like who is this Azari down in LA and where the hell is she getting these documents from? Like they just couldn't figure it out. I think the paralegal is getting it through FOIA, but they were pissed. Um, look, our job is to leave no stone unturned is to get everything we can to help our clients. So we're not doing anything wrong anyway. Right. Well, Sarah, I know that you represent uh, a lot of, you know, sex and domestic violence charges. Um, I don't know if you have a side job as a divorce lawyer. If not, you may consider doing that, but <laughs> I, I just know. wonder how do you handle these, you know, domestic dynamics and Jim, you know, I want to ask you afterwards, kind of similarly, you know, what happens when you have these, you know, kind of nutty clients who are pushing you around. Like, how do you show who's the boss? Anyway, Sarah, please go first. Well, so I do, I wouldn't say a lot, but a lot of my state practice, because I'm a woman, um, pretty good lawyer, I guess. I, I get clients who are um, accused of me too type claims, sexual assaults, rapes, um, uh, and then also restraining orders, domestic violence issues. Um, I wouldn't say it's the, a big part of my practice, but on the state side, I often get those. Um, it is, yeah, I don't know for how family lawyers do what they do because <laughs> the toxicity of that, you know, the relationships in domestic violence cases is 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 pretty challenging to manage and you know, we have ethical duties to our clients. So at this, while we're trying to also, you know, keep um, the accuser from being hostile, um, we want to keep them uh, on our side to the extent we can. We also have to be very careful not to witness tamper. Um, so I'm going to give you this example. Viewers I know love examples. Uh, about four years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a celebrity hairstylist here in Los Angeles, uh, gay, um, had a domestic felony, domestic violence arrest involving his husband and his husband from the very start was like, I don't want him charged. I don't want him convicted. I am not going to court. I was just drunk. Essentially what we call Jim and I a recanting witness, which is very similar, very common in domestic violence cases. And there's experts who come in and say, this is typical for an abuse victim to later change their, their mind and not want to go forward with prosecution. But this guy was like, I love him. We're going to separate, but I still love him. I don't. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> so on the one hand, I was happy that he was cooperative and it changed his mind. But I also knew that going to trial he is going to get up there and say all those things. And it's, you know, there's an expert going to come in and explain why he's saying those things. So fast forward, he asked me, but, but, but here's the thing, Jim, I just intuitively never really trusted this guy, this spouse. There was something about him that was like, so I told my investigator, I need you on all the phone calls. And um, sure enough, he called us and he said, you know, I, I want to find out when trial is. Um, I don't want to testify. What can I do not to testify? And I said, well, I can't tell you not to testify. I mean, the trial is set for this day. It's going to start within 10 days of this day. And 
if you are subpoenaed to trial, which they're going to need you, you're the victim, you have to show up. And he said, well, how would they subpoena me? I said, well, they would come to your door and hand you a subpoena or they'll come to your work, hand you a subpoena, or they might slip it under your door and say, call us to confirm that you got it. And he's like, okay, so if I don't get that, I have no obligation to show up to court. And I said, under the law, no. So I literally just explained the, the law to him. Well, two years later, after he went to a divorce lawyer and found out that under California law, he gets a bigger chunk of the uh, community property if he's an, a domestic violence victim, he decided to throw me under the bus and say that I essentially coached him not to show up at trial. So the DA's office that I work for 18 years cases against had the LAPD contact me, <laughs> investigating me for jury tampering or whatever. I mean, uh, witness tampering. And I immediately got my investigator to like talk to them. And thank God, you know, I was able to, he was, so my point here is that that's the craziness with that, with that dynamic you know, the volatility, the toxicity. And then, you know, I ain't losing my license over you, Bo. No. Jim, how about you? What, uh, what do you do when the, the client is just, you know, being, being pushy? Who's the boss here? Yeah. You know, the client's the client, but you know, we're the lawyers and, and we, you know, we, what, what I try to do is get the client to understand the law and the facts of their case. I mean, the body of law is, you know, you know, can describe it like as big as the universe. But any individual client's case is is pretty small, a small area of the law, small area of the facts. And so, I, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, teach them, let them understand, you know, my thinking, why I think the way I do. And, you know, I don't usually have a problem from them coming on board, but but ultimately, it's their decision whether to go to trial or not. And, yeah. and, and so, I mean, that's really in a criminal case. Is it going to plea or trial? No. And, and, you know, you, you, you give them all the information, you give them your best advice, but I, I don't tell them, Hey, you are, um, you're a damn idiot. If you're going to trial, uh, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. And, you know, I, I tell them, you know, it's your right to go to trial. I'm not going to talk you out of it. Um, but here's what's going to happen if you lose. And the evidence is stacked against you. Now we'll do our best. We won't quit. Well, but it's your decision. Ultimately, my recommendation is you take this plea. Um, uh, by and, the way, Jim, do you tell your clients that if they lose, that they're going to get more time than what they were offered? Oh yeah, because that is a fact. <laughs> well, that, that is a fact. That's not a courts threat. punish you for exercising your right to go to trial if you lose, and if they feel like they really that you really didn't have a triable issue and that you should have pled. Oh yeah, the yeah. man in the robe will punish you. Yeah, and oftentimes you'll have a you know have a deal where you know they're sitting on probation or a little bit of time. If they go to trial, they're doing a, you know significant amount of time. Exactly, and that's exactly. Um, and and but but Matt, they're on the other end of the spectrum is you'll have someone who's offered probation who's innocent, mm -hmm. but if they get convicted wrongly, they're going to go jail for a long period of time. And that yeah. client's telling you, "I want to plead, but I didn't do it." I want to plead, but I didn't. And our ethical yeah. obligation is to tell the client, you know, they cannot plead unless they admit to doing it. Now, yeah. I'm not telling you it doesn't happen, but, you know, you they can't get up there and tell the judge, yeah, I did it while telling me right b before I didn't do it. Because yeah. a year later, that client's going to come back and say, you know, I want to set aside my guilty plea because my client, my lawyer didn't give me advice. He told me to plead guilty on something mm -hmm. that I was innocent of. And so, mm -hmm. so that, that's a, you know, that's a rub too, but it's, I mean, it's, it's the nature of the beast. It's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I charge them a lot of money up front and I don't regret it. So. Me so, neither. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as we're wrapping things up here, I got just a couple more questions for you sure. guys. This first one might be uh, kind of big. It's definitely a big part of our show, which is the media getting involved with these cases. This is the most frustrating thing ever. How do you guys deal with the press? Is it ever okay for your clients to be talking to the press? And what about you guys as the attorneys? So no, 
Go ahead. Not, not okay for the client to talk yeah, to the person. Ever. Not okay. Ever. Like not okay, like they shouldn't, but they still might, or like it's actually illegal for them to do it? or how? No, to- it's oh. not illegal, but there's nothing a client can say. It, it is the worst idea because, you know, it boxes us in our, our ability. When they're speaking, they are the defendant. They're the person charged or accused. And any words coming out of their mouth can and will be used against them. So that's the problem. And like I said, it's a fluid process. And so typically when clients speak, it, it hinders our ability to fully put on a defense that we want to put. Donald Trump is an example. Um, he screwed himself in that E. Jean Carroll case. Alec Baldwin is another example who gave multiple, uh, interviews about, you know, not pulling the trigger at the end. He did pull the trigger. So, you know, it's never a good idea for a client to comment. And in my opinion, for me to comment, even if I say no comment, it's a comment. Hmm. Um, But there are instances, I think, that where I would want to just say two words about my client not being, you know, not being guilty Um, or, you know, that we're going to see something like that, something general, not getting into the weeds of the, the facts of the case. How about you, Jim? You ever uh, had a case with uh, the media involved yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, press leaking phone calls and things like that? <laughs> yeah, once, once or twice, but the, uh, I, I did, I've always, I've always engaged the media uh, rightfully yeah. or wrong, wrongfully just because, you know, the, they're, they're, they're going to r- report, you know, the story from the state or government's perspective most of the time because that's they have the charging document they don't they don't have anything in the defense now i I, I will i will tell you i developed really good relationships with reporters of all type and they respect when i'm giving them something off the record and they respect that and and there are certain requirements that they have before they report it and you know oftentimes i'll confirm a fact that they have learned and then they report it if but then, I, but I'm, so I do that. I work behind the scenes, you know, I'm just probably shouldn't be saying that to the world, but that's what we do. We, um, and, and then there are reporters who will double cross you and the reporter who's double crossed me, I'll never speak to again. And so I, you know, I got a list, I got a naughty list and a good list. And so <laughs> and the reporters on the naughty list don't get a re- return phone call. Who's on the naughty list and who's on the work, uh, good list. Yeah, I'm not saying. Nice <laughs> I'm not saying. Um, That's a jam. Well, just so I go away. Just so I can, no, but listen, it's a, you know, I I I was addressing more um like giving an interview or you right. know uh, whatever. But I agree with Jim in terms of press conferences. You know, you know if if the prosecution's out there talking about their case, Absolutely. I want to talk about my case because otherwise my client is guilty in the court of public opinion. So it just, it it really, but um, it's one of those things like if you watch Jim's presser on Murdoch uh, last week, he, he had a piece of paper, even though I'm sure he had it in his head. We really have to watch our words carefully. You know, it needs to be very tight um, and to the point and um not this sort of ongoing babble and narrative because right. you know we could go and tread into places that we don't want to go to. Well, speaking of minding your words, that actually leads nicely into my last question, which is the topic of the polygraph. Now, I'm fascinated by this. You see it in like uh, fake crime TV shows. Oh, the killer lied on a polygraph. He's guilty. Or my wife and I watch a lot of uh, horrible reality dating. They love to use the polygraph to find out if people really like the person they're dating. But the polygraph's bullshit, right? I mean, is the polygraph a thing in California? We really, we all know you clinch your butt and then it says that you're telling the truth, right? That's how it works. It's, uh, I've used a polygraph examiner, I think, once, Jack Tremarco, who's dead now, who's one of the best. Um, it, It does nothing. And I know it's different where Jim is. But uh, but for us, not only is inadmissible uh, in court, but prosecutors don't care about it. They don't require it for any sort of behind the scenes dealings. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to put my client through it to prove anything to me uh, when it really I can't do anything with it. So it's really worthless uh, here. Is it like a legal precedent or something in South Carolina where they're no. like, this has worked, so we must now do this now? 
No, it uh, no. So it's not admissible and as evidence of anything in South Carolina, and it it and they'll tell you it's an investigative tool, and and what what it's used for is by law enforcement to try to coerce a confession. I mean, and I you know I've had it happen more than once where you know it it all levels where the client is told you didn't do so well on the polygraph. You know what you know what are you holding back? when the client passed the polygraph of flying colors, but they don't know that. And it's just a, it's just a, it's just a tool to try to get a confession or, or get inconsistent statements. And so, you know, very few times in my career have I been put in a position where a client takes a polygraph. I don't like it. Um, and I don't believe in them and I push back every time. It's pretty common here to have a fee, a plea agreement. I think we may have, just file one today in a case that you're familiar with that has a polygraph provision in there that says, you know, you part of your cooperation, you have to be truthful. And in one of the measures of truthfulness, you have to pass a polygraph to our satisfaction. Well, what the hell does that mean to our satisfaction? I mean, it means nothing. Hmm. And, and so it's pretty standard here to have that. It's a, it's a shortcut for, you know, good law enforcement work and it's, you know, and, and it's not reliable. So you know, I, I've had clients uh, when I've had a position to take a polygraph, they've taken a polygraph, but what, and I'm there, I never leave them, never leave them to take a polygraph alone because the polygraph test is not where the damage is done. It's the post test interview where the, where the polygrapher says, Oh, we got, you see here, it jumped, it jumped. You're, you know, you're lying to us. And, yeah. and what are you holding back? And, and so, you know, I shut that down. I don't permit that at all. If they say they flunked, I go, well, sorry, see you. And then we're, we're out of here, but we don't, I do not engage in post polygraph interviews with clients and I hate polygraphs. I, I don't put my clients on polygraphs. Um, sometimes they're forced to as part of a plea agreement. And I That's tell you, crazy that your plea agreement, it sounds so coercive to me that oh, to, take, oh. to change your plea, you have to take a polygraph that they choose the polygraph examiner. Well, not, not to change your plea, but if you're cooperating and oh, you're cooperating, and you want the benefit of cooperation yeah. and they don't believe you. Well, guess what? I mean, but, really, the only I mean, time they ask you to take a polygraph is when you exculpate someone who they think is guilty and they go, OK, well, I'm going to put you on a polygraph. But you're that doesn't even make, I mean, listen, I, I've done. I don't know how many dozens and dozens of, uh, you know, I've represented people who've cooperated on the federal side. And if they don't believe you, there's multiple agents in the room and at least one prosecutor in the room. And they know more than you and your client know. And that's why I always tell people to go in not being half pregnant, but giving them everything that they know truthfully and fully. And so if they feel like you're not being credible, they just don't use you. What is this polygraph? I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you, they, well, they use it here to blow up a plea agreement. That's what they use it for. Wow. That's crazy. Well, All this right. was great guys. Thank you for uh, answering these, uh, these questions. I'm sure uh, myself and other listeners are going to have many more in the uh, months to follow. So hopefully we can do shows like this uh, periodically. Um, but I just want to say thank you guys for your time today. Thanks to all the listeners for subscribing to our show on YouTube, on all the podcast platforms, on social. Uh, we're going to be back uh, next week with another great conversation for you guys. But uh, until next time, Jim, Sarah, we rest. We rest. We rest.